Yes, hello, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV, live from the all new Joyrider studios here on the Greek island of Lefkos. I'd just like to say thanks to everybody who's tuning in. Something weird is going on. I might have to put a stop to that. Okay, let's uh, let's put a stop to that right now. I couldn't cope with that. Some sort of weird delay on the talking. Um, yes, so here we are with some more Q&A where I am going to be looking at your catamaran sailing questions and seeing if I've got some worthy answers so that you can get more from your boat. You can have fewer problems. Um, perhaps stall fewer tacks, uh, anything maintenance related, sailing related, anything like that. Just fire away and I will do what I can. As always, I have got some preloaded questions as well. So um, looking forward to digging in there as well. Uh, very nice. Yes. So just checking in with everybody who's checking in. We've got Mark on board. Checking in from Grand Lake St. Mary's, Ohio, USA. Great to have you on board as always, Mark. And we've got Toot in Texas, who Toot always hits the like button when he comes in. Never say anything other than that. Got it up to 83 a couple of days ago. Bunch are talking about going out on Sunday, water 54 wind 20 knots plus we'll take some of that yeah wrap up warm uh temperature equals 63 great stuff there toot oh we got hey we got hein on board uh clocking in from alabama welcome to the session hein great to have you with us matthew's on board as well hey do matthew good to see you there and uh, coley's on board as well in canada i am guessing and then Benedetto is also with us today. So thanks to everybody for tuning in. And I think we're just going to steam in straight away with question number one, uh, which is from contestant number one. Uh, no, it's not actually. It's from Chris um, over on Patreon. Uh, Chris has some questions for Q&A. So question number one is he's... Got a NACRA 5.8, so that is a boat just under 20 feet long, um, sort of similar to the Hobie Tiger, I think, as a boat that we feature quite regularly on Joyrider TV. And he has just got a square top mainsail. So we can dive in here immediately with just what am I talking about? So, if this is our mast, a sort of traditional shape mainsail would be something like that. But the much more modern shape to have on most boats, um, especially the bigger boats, like the NACRA 5.8 or the Hobie Tiger, Tornado, um, like on Chris's Prindle, eight, uh, Prindle 19, would be a square top mainsail where we've got... Basically, a longer top batten. So the top batten would be like that. And then from sort of the middle downwards, uh, it would be pretty similar to a what in Greece, hilariously, they call the old style of mainsail a cheese pie mainsail. Because here in Greece, if you get a cheese pie from a baker's, it is that shape of the old style main uh, mainsail. Uh, the square top mainsail, the big benefit there is you've got that big top batten and a load of sail area at the top, which means 
the boat is going to get going, firstly, in much less wind. It's going to perform much better in less wind than a cheese pie. We're calling the old sail the cheese pie, by the way, and I'm going to stick to that just so that we know what we're talking about. So, number one, we've got more sail area at the top, which means we're going to get going more um, sooner in less wind. It's going to give us a bit more power, uh, a bit more drive in the lighter winds. But then you may think, but surely if it's giving us that much more power in the lighter winds, when the wind gets up, it's going to become a bit of a handful. Well, this could surprise you. But no, because we've got this long top batten, that batten has got a certain amount of elasticity, which means when it bends away, when that pressure goes, that batten will bring it back to the original shape. So it's almost like we've got, for when it's windier, we've got a bit of suspension in the top of the mainsail, which will kind of, because we're only getting so much tension through the leech at that top part of the sail. So most of the shape there is held by the batten. So if the wind increases and we've got her tuned up nicely, um, the sail is going to open almost on its own. And then if the pressure in the sail reduces, it's going to close on its own. Science. Yeah. And it means you don't have to work as hard to keep the boat at optimum. Now, um, what are we talking about here? So Chris has asked, do you have any pointers for sailing uh, with the square top? He's new to it and he's going in straight into some racing this weekend. OK, yes. Yeah, so um, the first thing and I would say quite an important thing when you're using a square top mainsail is batten stiffness. Very important um, that because not all battens are the same. You get different stiffnesses of batten. So some which bend very easily. I don't happen. Oh. I could use this as an example. Some that bend very easily, not like that, though. Um, and some which are much stiffer like this. So if we were to push down it, uh, it wouldn't bend. A way to determine if you've got a number of battens of the right length and you want to find out um, which um, battens are stiffer than the others Basically, if you take your batten like this, put it on the floor, this is the floor, like this, push down on the end and see how hard it is to make it bend at all. So um, a way we can actually measure the stiffness of the battens is if this is like bathroom scales, we push down looking at the scales and we see what the number is when it starts to bend. So the bigger the number is there, that means you've got stiffer batten. Stiffer battens are going to be much better for higher winds because it's going to hold the top of the sail much flatter. So when we're racing, we're generally changing the top three battens or two battens, depending on the wind strength and what our batten situation is. Um, yeah, so those top three battens or two battens, we change. Basically, you'd have two different stiffnesses, soft ones to put in if the wind is light and then hard ones to put in once you're fully powered double trapezing. That would be what we're looking at there. Now, something to look at on the beach before putting the boat in the water, because this can be an annoyance if your batten is the wrong stiffness, is um, put the mainsail up, put some downhaul. If the wind's going to be light, put the minimum amount of downhaul on. So just take all of the creases out of the front edge of the sail and then the battens should pop into their shape. 
and looking down, you should have a good curve in the sail like that. Then just have a look to see how easy or difficult is it to get the baton to pop onto the other side. Because if it's light wind and you're racing, whenever you tack, you don't want to be having to wrestle the boat to get the baton to pop across. So again, if you have got the option to change your battens, this would actually be because either the baton is in way too tight. So we're going off on all sorts of tangents here. But when you're putting your battens in, whatever the boat is that you're using, you don't want to put them in so there's a massive amount of curve in the sail when it's resting on the floor. You want to put those battens in so that you're just taking all of the creases out of the batten pocket. Because if you put in any more, then you don't have the ability to take that curve out of the sail as much as if you just do them loose. Well, not loose, but just take the creases out and then you put the curve into the sail using the downhaul. When you pull the downhaul on, curve goes in. So if the top baton won't pop, check it's not tied in too tightly and then check that it's not too soft. If you've got the option to swap it out for a slightly stiffer baton, that means it's going to pop across much easier. But other than that, the difference is um, not that much in the actual sailing. You just shouldn't have to trim the main sheet quite as much as you do with a cheese pie. Um, so because the top of the sail is going to be working a bit more for you in the gusts and the lulls. So there we go. That is part one of Chris's questions. What do you need to know about using a square top mainsail for the first time? Uh, and that would be it. Just going to check in with everybody who's checking in before moving on to part two. All right. So we've got uh, Benedetto is from Toscana. We've got Chris on board, of course, in Texas. Um, and then Hein has got a question. How hard would it be to sail a foiling cat for the first time? Now, that is a great question, Hein. And my answer is I can't wait to find out because I am still not. Um, I still haven't been foiling on a catamaran. And to be honest, I absolutely can't wait. So if anybody wants to bring a foiling catamaran to Vasiliki, Greece, then I would love to have a go. Thank you very much. Now, how hard would it be? I think one of the biggest difficulties from my experiencing foiling monohulls and other foiling vessels is um, it would be very twitchy. So if you're used to a conventional boat, which I think all of us are, um, the conventional boat, because you've generally got the hulls in the water, those hulls like that keep the boat going in a straight line. Whereas when you lose that because there's no boat in the water, the boat is going to become much, much looser. It's going to be so twitchy. So you just really need to be on Let's not steer then. Um, don't steer. I would, this is just assuming because I haven't actually done it, but that is what I think would be the big difference there, as well as the added bit of what do you call it, um, intimidation from your boat being quite high up out of the water. But that, I suppose, could be compared to just flying a hull. You wouldn't be any higher out of the water than if you were flying a hull really high. And then of course the speed that you're going at. So I would say um, start off like anything in light winds. Oh yes. All right, we've got Joachim from Argentina on board. Hello and welcome, great to have you here. All right, Chris says RBS probably makes some of the best. I believe he is probably talking about battens there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, we got Max on board from a nine degrees centigrade or Celsius Rosenheim, Germany. No wind today. Taipan and Nakra had to stay under the cover on the beach, hoping for tomorrow for up to 20 knots of wind. I, if I was wearing a hat there, Max, I would tip my hat to you for that level of enthusiasm for going out sailing when it's that cold. And to anybody else who is into a bit of cold weather sailing. Um, yeah, I think perhaps too many years in Greece has made me soft. Anyway. All right. So Chris says if um, you're after, I'm assuming that RBS is Batten's, but if they are, um, he says, call Romeo at RBS and tell them that I sent you. That's Chris um, sent you if you're buying new Batten's. All right. Benedetto says, I would like to change the latest three Batten's on my tornado and set a softer one to increase the light wind power. Yeah, the difference is significant. And, um, you know, if if um, money was absolutely no problem at all and you could spend as much money as you like on your boat, then what um, would really hit the, the spot would be to basically find what your soft battens are going to be and then have all of the battens in the mainsail exactly the same stiffness. So you could actually go see Romeo at RBS and uh, say, Romeo, give me a set of battens and then give me five sets of battens and then test all of them um, to see what the different the tolerances are in stiffness and get a set of battens which are absolutely identical for that perfect sales sail shape. Um, but that would only really be necessary if you were going to be racing at a very high level. If you're going to be competing on the speed stick, then I think you could just, because if you generally with the fast sailing, you're on a reach, you're not going upwind for the top speeds. So run what you brung. I think is what uh, has been said. All right, Joachim says, how do you manage if you find yourself out there with way too much wind? That happened to me a few weeks ago in a F-18. No forecast or the usual, usual cues. 30 years sailing here and never got in 30 knots expecting 20. Yeah, so... Um, the main issue with if there is just too much wind is if you need to sail downwind because you get to a certain amount of wind and then even to turn the boat downwind becomes a real issue. So we can do our usual strategies. If all right. So let's backpedal slightly. So you're out sailing and the wind increases significantly. There are two ways which you can manage your boat, or let's say three ways, in fact. So way number one is to keep sailing as normal and just to try to depower the boat as much as possible and keep trying to sail it as efficiently as we can. So that means cranking on the downhaul as much as you can um, and then easing the travelers out um, to try to spill off a bit of wind that way um, and to try to keep sailing with the mainsail as flat as possible, which means if we're going upwind, bringing the mast rotation in a bit, really cranking on the main sheet as well. That has a massive effect. Winding the jib in as much as we physically can to blade the jib, to flatten it off. Um, but then if you're getting to a stage, um, and sorry, if you're sailing a boat which has um, not uh, like the tornado, but um, 
Oh, on an F-18, yeah. If you're sailing an F-18, lift the dagger boards a bit higher. If you bring the dagger boards up that much more, it makes the boat much less wanting to lift the hull because um, the boat wants to naturally get pushed sideways. The more resistance we've got under the boat means the more the hull is going to lift. So if we lift the dagger boards a bit more, it's going to slide sideways more and we're not going to lift the hull as much. There we are. Um, so that would be number one, try to continue sailing the boat efficiently. Uh, the trick shot is turning from upwind to downwind. And the, tr the trick there is just to go into it as fast as possible on your upwind course. And then what I would do is ease a load of jib off first. Because there's, even though the jib isn't that big on an F-18, there's still plenty of power there. And then as you turn the corner, wait right at the back and ease the traveler and the main sheet too much as you turn the corner. What that means is that you should be giving yourself by over easing the traveler and the main sheet. It means that rather than bearing away bow digs a bit so you ease out, you've already eased out. So you've given yourself that little cushion of less power as you go through the corner. And then you're just trying to get through that corner as soon as you can, as quickly as you can. Um, and then you'll know when you're around the corner because everything will settle down. You could come in off the trapeze, sit on the trampoline and think, wow, that was fun. OK, so method number two would be to keep the sails as normal, but limp along. So a way to do this is to completely release the downhaul. Maybe this sounds crazy, um, but if you take all of the shape out of the mainsail, um, you can sail with no main sheet on um, as long as you're sailing anything. Anything in this region. So anything from a beam reach and higher, you can just pretty much sail on the jib with the mainsail not really doing very much. But the best thing to do, unless you've got to sail upwind, so this is option number three, is drop the mainsail and then just sail on the jib. Uh, that is going to be the safest and the least likely way that you're going to capsize. So it just requires a little bit of practice and technique to get the mainsail down while you're out sailing. That is the thing. But that is what I would look at. Um, all right. So Chris says, don't forget, you will need more main tension to close the square top. There we are. You will have to sheet in a bit more with a square top sail if you really want to close it at the top. All right, we've got Russell on board, dial N-07. Great to have you on board, Russell. Russell says, how many of you have hit the like button? Thanks for asking, Russell. All right, we've got David on board. Hi, David. David asks, oh, here we go. This is a good one. Have you ever seen a crossbar installed on the bows of a Hobie 16 in conjunction with the jib bridle? From an engineering standpoint, I would eliminate hull flexing and increase jib tension. Uh, the short answer is no. I've never seen that in all of my days. There are several catamarans that do use a, um, I think they, all the manufacturers call it something different. But just to draw on what we're talking about here is back beam, front beam, then we've got our bridle wires here. And then on some boats, like the Dart 16, what else? Like on certain Top Cats, the, the classic Hobie 17, 
what else? There are there are many others, but um, the California Cat Sport Cruiser 21. Oh yes, they've got a beam that goes between the bows like that. Now, the reason a lot of these boats have got that beam is because there is otherwise just too much bow unsupported. So, And, of course, when we're pulling, I say of course, of course, of course, when we're pulling in the main sheet hard, all that pull is going up through the leech, the back edge of the main sheet, the main sail, through the mast. And then pulling on the forestay, it's pulling directly against the forestay, and that is pulling directly on the bridle wires. So if the bows of our boat aren't strong enough, that will actually cause the bows to go in like that, or for one of them to fold in half. This has happened with older boats. I had um, that happen on my Dart 18 back in the day. Um, so that is why these spreader um bars are used on these but i don't know how it would work for stiffening the boat up but if anyone wants to try it we'd be um very excited to see all right we got pier paolo ola on board ciao great to have you with us all right benedetto says is it right to sail on tornado with almost the same daggerboard position. Yeah, so on a tornado or any boat that has pivoting centerboards, um, which um, actually happens to have one of the best words in the German language, which is Schwenkschwerter. Um, so if you're sailing with Schwenkschwerter on your boat, um, Sorry, that's a hull. That's a pivoting centerboard. So rather than like on the F-18 uh, where or a Hobie 18 Classic, where the centerboard or daggerboard goes up and down, on here, if we look inside the hull, there's a pivot here. It comes out of the top. And when we want to put the centerboard up, it actually goes backwards and sits inside the hull. Now, the reason why we don't put the centerboards up halfway, for example, is because if we did, when this goes halfway back here, what that's doing is it's completely changing the center of lateral resistance on the boat. So um, if we put the center of lateral resistance back here, we are going to have the filthiest amount of lee helm. That means all of the time while you're sailing along, you're going to have to be pushing the stick away to keep the boat going in a straight line, which means it's not very safe. Um, so that is why on the boats with pivoting sense boards, it's either all the way down or all the way up. I think if you were sailing for a very long time in perhaps quite windy conditions um, on one tack, maybe it would be beneficial to lift the windward scent board completely, get rid of that bad boy, put it in the hull. Uh, otherwise, the standard format is to leave them both down the whole time. There we go. All right, we've got Lee on board who says, hey, Joe and Joy Riders from North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Great to have you on board, Lee. Hope it's all good. Um, all right, nice. So Russell says, oh, no, Russell's chatting with Lee. Do you sail out of Myrtle Beach? You should come and see us at Lake Wackamau. We've got four F-18s, two F-16s and some Hobies. You're not far away. Nice. This is uh, connecting people. Every This is the uh, exchange scheme for catamaran sailors. All right. Toot says the Hobie 17 with a jib needs the crossbar. There we go. All right. So we're pretty much up to 30 minutes. So if Toot can cue 
the elevator music. I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Mm. Water or any drink tastes better out of a Joyrider TV metal bottle available from totaljoyrider.com. Mm. Okay, yeah, so back to the next. Thank you, Toot, for the elevator music. Um, back to the next of Chris's preloaded questions. All right, this is a nice one as well. He said, um, my crew asked, and I thought you could explain, when racing upwind and you receive a gust, why do we ease the main before... Uh, I think he says there, uh, before heading up into the wind. So why is it more efficient on the upwind course, whether racing or otherwise, to ease the main rather than to steer up into the wind? Well, firstly, I'd say that's not 100% uh, true for starters. So what we're looking to do when we're sailing um, upwind is a number of things we, as we know, the whole thing is a big compromise between speed and height. So if we sail really close to the wind, we're going to be sailing a shorter distance or so we think um, and we're going to be pointing more directly at our target. But if we sail a bit off the wind like this, we're going to be going much faster. Now, firstly, in answer to the question about the gust, when a gust hits and you're sailing upwind, whichever we'll call these different modes. So this is pointing mode. And this is speed mode. There are different times to be using those different modes when we're racing. But um, in either mode, when we get a gust, what we want to do is we do want to head up more towards the wind. But we don't want to head up so much that the boat slows down. If the boat starts slowing down, it means that we've headed up too much. And we've just lost some speed, which if we're racing is definitely not what we want to be doing. So what we want to do is when the gust hits, if you're sailing a, a sophisticated boat, which has the downhaul taken out to the trapeze, what you want to do, if you're double trapezing, gust hits, hull starts to come up. Then you start to squeeze the downhaul on more. We'll call it squeeze it on because it sounds nice. Uh, squeeze the downhaul on more. And then what that will do is transform that extra wind into more power because that will flatten the sail. That will open up the leech. It will um, open that top batten on your, on your square top mainsail if you've got one or even on a cheese pie it's going to open the top batten a certain amount. So we're going to squeeze the downhaul on. And then if we're still lifting the hull higher, this is all going to happen in a very short uh, period of time. Then we're going to, we're not going to push the boat up into the wind. We're going to allow it to turn up towards the wind very slightly. There should always be a slight pull on the rudders. So if we just don't fight it, allow the boat to come up to the wind. But if to stop the hull from lifting any higher, you have to go so far up into the wind that the boat slows down, that is when you should ease a bit of main sheet as well. So we're going to use a combination of main sheet and steering if the gust is that big that we're going to lose speed by turning the boat into the wind. I'll just leave that for a second to sink in. All right. So what we're also trying to achieve 
when we're sailing on the upwind course is to have the boat going fast. So speed mode is definitely good, but it works well speed mode if you're a heavier team because you're able to keep the power cranked on a little bit further away from the wind. If you're about able to do that, you can sail your boat much faster than, uh, than the guy who's pointing mode. And by sailing faster, it means you've got more water going over your centerboards, over your rudders, which is going to give you more lift. Those foils are going to work more efficiently, which actually means, although you're sailing down here, he's sailing up here, he's going to be slipping sideways much more than you. He's going to have, be having much more leeway, which actually means by the time you come to when you tack, you should be not that far off. So don't be too afraid just to sail on in speed mode as long as you've got the weight to really pin it down. There we go. So that was question number two from Chris. Um, all right. Uh, Bernadetto says, please send me your link to buy sailing stuff. I'll even put it in the live chat. Total joyrider.com. Get in there. Um, specializing in custom designs of t shirts and hoodies. Uh, this is one fresh in. Woohoo! Joyrider TV with the boat. This, this design I've called Send It, uh, incidentally. Um, yeah, so there you go. Head over. Um, anything else in the live chat? All right. So Toot says, my sales are okay on my NACRA 5.7, but you've sparked me on replacing the main and jib. Would a flat top and larger jib be too much? Depends how much you want, doesn't it? Um, a bigger jib is going to make the boat much quicker on a reach or downwind course. Um, the square top mainsail is not actually, if the sailmaker who's making it is building to the class rules, they're not going to make it so it's any more square meters. They're just redistributing the allowed sail area and putting more at the top. So it kind of looks after itself. Um, in fact, with your Hobie 17, um, from when I was talking to Chip from Whirlwind Sales, um, Chip is kind of ruling the world. Um, he's the king of the Hobie 17 mainsail world uh, with his square top mainsails for the Hobie 17. But um, for the NACRA 5.7, flat top, yes, larger jib, um, if you really want that much more power. All right. So uh, Hans is on board. Hello, Hans. Uh, good to have you on board. Hans was, of course, working. He was the the uh, the tornado pilot um, on the Wildwind Beach last summer. Um, if you're watching this and you were lucky enough to go for a sail with Hans, do put it in the comments below. Hello, Hans. Thanks very much. All right. So on to the next part of the question. This is another one from... Um, from Chris. Um, uh, where am I looking? All right. So. Oh, so uh, a light wind mainsail setting question for upwind sailing. So as we know, when we're sailing upwind or on any point of sail in light winds, it's very important not to have the mainsail oversheated. Um, so we'll draw a large boat. Let's have a mainsail in a different colour just to spice things up a little bit. So if we have the mainsail oversheated, 
what can happen is the leech of the mainsail, this is an exaggeration, can actually end up further upwind than the mast. That should never happen. Um, because what happens is, okay, you might have good airflow just here and maybe just here, but as soon as you get here, we're going to be into a load of turbulent airflow. And here, the wind isn't going to have the energy to kind of be attached to the mainsail anymore. So we're only actually going to be using effectively the very front part of the mainsail. So that is why it's very important not to be oversheeted. Now, Chris asks, so if we're sailing upwind and something else that maybe we know already is when we're sailing upwind, our ability to point comes from the tension in the leech of the mainsail. Is everybody with me on that? So a tight main sheet is going to help us get sail closer to the wind. However, the tighter we have the main sheet, the more of a knife edge we are walking on that, are we stalling the mainsail or not? Knife edge, which is why it's generally better to sail with the main sheet a little bit looser than optimal, just to make sure that at no point are we going to be oversheeted. Does that sound fair? I think it does. Because as soon as we're oversheeted and the mainsail stalls, we're going to lose all of our speed and it's going to require a lot of energy to get the boat back up to speed. And if we are racing, everybody else is going to destroy us. So Chris asks, well, how about so that we can keep our main sheet tension? Can anybody guess? Can we not just ease a bit of traveller? So we've still got all that main, that lovely main sheet tension, but without the risk of stalling the airflow. Well, it's, I would say, unless there's enough wind to start lifting the hull slightly where you've got really good pressure in the rudders and the boat is definitely moving forwards, you should always be sailing with the main sheet eased a bit because otherwise, what can happen if you've got too much curve in the sail, the wind needs a certain amount of energy to follow that curve in the sail. So here, this wind over the back of the sail is going to get to there and it's not going to have the energy to follow the sail anymore. So it's just going to it's just going to leave and we're not, again, we're not, maybe we're not stalling so much, but we're just putting too much curve into the sail. So it's better to have a slightly open leech when the wind is really light. That gives us that margin for error, that little bit, um, yeah, better, better. That's my answer, better to have the main sheet eased a bit. But by all means, have the traveller eased a little bit as well. But in a boat with a high aspect mainstay, like your NACRA 5.8, like your F-18, like your Tornado, as soon as you eat, like your Prindle 19, as soon as you ease the traveller out, you're going to lose a significant amount of your pointing ability. So keep the traveller in if you can. All right. All right. So Benedetto asks, what do you think for the tornado to equip it with the Chopper Cabra? A kind of code zero for light winds. Yeah, I think that would be very nice indeed. In fact, it was, um, I think it was the Olympic Games in Beijing. I uh, can't remember what year that was. Must have been, what was that, 2004? Was that 2008? 2008, probably. 
um, that the tornadoes were using code zeros because the wind was generally very light. And like what we were saying earlier, with getting the boat going as fast as possible to get the foils working, um, they did start actually using the code zeros sailing upwind to get more speed. Yes, they weren't pointing as high, but they were getting those foils working much better. So for light winds, uh, yes, the code zero, if um, if you want to get another sail, um, is a good option if you've already got a conventional spinnaker. All right, so Max says, yeah, I took hands out on several joyrides on the C2, Tornado and Tiger. Nice. I hope to see him in June again in Wild with Vasiliki. Oh, we're looking forward to seeing you as well, uh, Max. Lovely job for my final outing on the Wildwind Beach. All right. So next preloaded question. Here we go. This one actually, you're not going to believe it. What a coincidence. Ryan just appear, appears to have appeared uh, in the live chat. And not only that, um, but um, Ryan's got a preloaded question in the preloaded questions department. Um, and it's a good question. You're going to like it. Um, I think people might be becoming quite familiar with Ryan's boat. Not, it, not only is it now available as an MOG, but um, it's also been the cover, cover feature of two What Went Wrong videos and the last Speed Stick video. Um, so Ryan has a NACRA 500, um, and this could be applied to any boat, but, um, you may have seen in some of my videos that, um, I have a camera, which is out the side of the boat. So we're going to draw a boat again. Um, could have left it on there really. All right, so there we are on the boat out the side and we have a camera. Here, filming the sailors on the boat, and I really do think it gets a stunning picture. So pleased with the outcome of all of that research and development. So what I'm using here is the top section of a windsurfing mast um, because we want something quite thick and sturdy that isn't going to flex as we sail along because any flexing, even if you've got a camera which has stabilization on there, um, any flexing like that, with the stabilization is going to be working harder and that means we're going to be losing a bit of quality from the end picture. So top section of a windsurfing mast, very nice. And then it's pretty agricultural what I'm doing um, with it. So uh, let's have a different color for this in blue. So um, what I'm doing um, is there's generally on most, most boats, in fact, I'd say on all boats, just where the trampoline goes in to the front beam, um, there's generally a gap just here. So I'm utilizing that gap there to basically tie the pole. So we're tying the pole there. And then this end of the pole, I'm tying to the center of the dolphin striker. And that's, that's it. Um, over time, I've made it a bit more efficient where I'm using a piece of elastic with a clip on it so I don't have to tie knots all the time. But the GoPro Max um, 360 camera, uh, this Insta what's it called? Insta360 seems to be getting a lot of love on the internet now as well. Um, but either 
360 camera, really good. If you, not that I'm saying anybody should go buy a new camera, but they are really good. Um, because then you can, it, using the artificial intelligence on board, you actually get rid of the pole. So it does look like you've got some sort of weird drone footage. But I think with a normal camera, just having it facing the sailors on the boat is a really nice shot as well. But I think with a normal camera, having it facing the boat, so you've got the stick in the shot, isn't quite as juicy shots. Thanks. Oh, okay, Benedetto there. I was trying to work out what 2008 is um, referring to. It is the Olympic Games in Beijing. Um, all right, yeah, Ryan says we're making omelettes. Yeah, so um, Ryan has been featured more times in What Went Wrong than anybody else. In fact, there is going to be another episode of What Went Wrong coming quite soon. So if you've got any footage of something going wrong while you've been sailing, send it to me and you could be you will be featured in the next What Went Wrong. Um, incidentally, incidentally, the next show us your cat is going to be this Sunday. Oh, yes. Um, I've spent half a day today writing the script because um, there's quite a few boats that we're going to be looking at. Filming is tomorrow morning. Editing tomorrow afternoon. Sunday will be the big release of Show Shoe Cat 131. There we are. All right. So um, another preloaded question. Oh, and this one is from Simone and Paco, who are sailing from in Gran Canaria, in the Canary Islands, um, on a Hobie 16. Uh, they're asking, how do we, like, if you're doing this, how do we get those amazing looking gauges on the video? Big question. Well, the answer is, I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but if you're using um, one of these Insta360 cameras will do it. Or um, if you're using a GoPro, which is at the oldest, a five, so a five or newer, then that has an inbuilt GPS. Um, and then using the data from the GoPro, I use, um, is it on a web? No, uh, an application on the computer because generally video files are quite big. So much better to do on a computer rather than on your telephone. Um, I use uh, an application called telemetry overlay. It does what it says on the tin. Um, and there's actually a link to telemetry overlay overlay in the description below of the video uh, with a code which if you use that code, you get a sweet discount because it does cost money. But from um, trying loads and loads of different free software to do the same thing, it was all so clanky and awkward to use. As soon as I started using telemetry overlay, it was like, oh, I'm so glad I paid the money because this is perfect. Works very easily, very good results. Gives you the speed in knots, which um, is essential, I think, if you're sailing a boat. Uh, so check it out in link in the description. Perhaps the description isn't there at the moment because we're live. But as soon as we're not live, then there will be a description beneath the video. There we are. All right. So back into the live chat. I've actually made a video on how to use telemetry overlay to overlay telemetry as well. There we are. All right. So um, we've got Mauricio who says, would you recommend the Hobie Wave for a beginner? Yeah, I think it is a, it's a, it's a fine choice. It's a fine choice of boat. Uh, very simple. As far as a, a small catamaran goes, it is pretty much as simple as you're ever going to find a boat. 
So very straightforward to sail. It's made from like PVC plastic. So it's extremely durable. It will require almost zero maintenance. The only things you'd have to do with a Hobie Wave is um, washing a boat. If it's been in salt water, always a good idea. But occasionally, like every four years, replace the rigging that holds the mast up. Um, but other than that, uh, it's a very durable, really fun, easy to sail, small catamaran. Um, and yes, a good starting point. Depends a little bit on if you want to sail alone or with others. If you're sailing alone, then the wave would be a good choice. But if you're sailing perhaps with two or three adults on board, then maybe something a little bit bigger might be better. Like, a boat that I'm kind of drawn to a bit as a good and readily available in the used market as well, Catamaran, is the Dart 16, which is a bit bigger. Um, again, very easy to sail, but it's got that bit more volume in the hulls so it can carry a bit more weight. The other benefit with the Wave is that it's quite a light boat, so handling it on land because part of the actual sailing process is getting the boat from wherever you park it on the land into the water. So a lighter boat is, of course, going to make that a bit easier. Thanks very much for your question. Hope the response was useful. Telemetry looks very good. Yes, thanks, Cuxolly. I think so too. Um, so happy when I, when I discovered telemetry overlay uh, it's the the software is made by a guy called Juan in Spain and uh, he's a one man band I believe he just he's out there on his own uh, on the keyboard making software and it is very good and the customer service is excellent as well if there's anything that doesn't work quite as you want it to I well for me I just email him and he try this and then there we are all right, Toot says, Hobie Wave comes out to our launch. We are rigging for an hour and they pull it, they pull up and in the water in 10 minutes. Looks like fun. Okay, yeah, so it takes two an hour to get his boat in the water, whereas the Hobie Wave from on the trailer to in the water 10 minutes. Now that is worth a look. All right, Cuxolly says, do you ever seen the catamaran video with the camera at a badminton ball. Ah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I don't know what it's called in English, but it looks very cool because it's flying behind the cat. Yeah, um, these are actually for sale. I can't remember what they're called, but um, basically what Cuxolly is saying is there's a camera mount. Something just fell over, by the way. Um, here's our sail. And then there's a camera mount that actually flies behind the boat. Um, so you have a bit of line and then onto this bit of line, if anybody's familiar with the sport badminton, um, it's the thing they hit in badminton called a shuttlecock, would you believe, in English, which basically is a slightly modified this is a really big picture of one. And there's the camera there, which kind of flies behind the boat. Now, I think it would be very cool to try one. There is a company who are making these. Um, but my the thing that put me off initially was it was very expensive, um, which... That put me off. And I'm kind of getting a similar shot with the 360 camera extending back from the boom. But maybe it is worth a try. Quite expensive. And then the other thing that I thought was if your boat speed drops below a certain point, it's not going to fly anymore. Um, so is it going to end up in the water or do you have a slightly shorter? rope 
line, bit of fishing line or something, I should think, uh, to make sure it doesn't end up in the water. I think it'd be really fun to see the footage from there. Um, but yeah, that's what I think about that. All right. All right, Benedetto says, pitch pole, single sailing on a 20-foot cat. Boom. Chris says, I'm having a look. I'm sorry, I'm I'm looking at having a friend make me one of those badminton birdie camera holder things. Nice. Yeah, I absolutely can't wait to see the result of that, Chris. I hope it works. Uh, Cuxolly, thanks very much for the very kind super sticker donation um that is very good that's gonna go towards uh uh buy me dinner lovely job um oh ryan says it's called a birdie in the U us so there we go finishing on the birdie or the shuttlecock so anyway there we are one hour pretty much on the nose i think that's a good time to call it a day for today thanks to everybody for tuning in live but also thanks to everybody who is watching this later on as well. Don't forget to hit the like button before you leave. Um, if you're new over here at Joyrider TV, then you should subscribe and check out all of the stuff in the archives. If you're finding the archives of videos on YouTube quite difficult to navigate, then there is a link in the description below, which actually will take you to a list that I've prepared of all of the videos that I've made up until 2022, uh, 2021, sorry. So um, yeah, check that out if you want to easier navigate through this sea of videos that I have made. I think there's over 700 videos now on Joyrider TV. So thanks very much. I'd like to say hello to Keith in Minnesota and also goodbye. Um, and uh, We'll see you on Sunday. Perhaps we'll even do it as a premiere, which means we can have the live chat uh, at, when we're watching Show Us Your Cat on Sunday at 5.30 Greek time, the, new, the usual time. Otherwise, be back next Friday with some more of this. Thank you very much.